among the cuts from the budget deal passed for the remainder of the 2011 fiscal year are cuts to occupational training grants at community colleges, green jobs classes, and a program to help low-income, older workers acquire new job skills, more than $870 million in all. The Green Job Innovation Fund will take a $40 million hit. Analysts say these cuts will put the country's chance for innovation in jeopardy. What's the best way to save money and invest in tomorrow's future without adding to the already huge deficit? Daniel, I think part of the conversation that surrounds this whole area is the understanding that sometimes you have to spend a lot of money up front to save even more money down the road. But right now, that feels like a luxury we can't afford. We know that, for instance, uh, solar energy may be cheaper in five years, 10 years, 20 years. But right now, it's more expensive than doing nothing. Well, first of all, uh, investing in clean energy is like spending a lot of money to go to college. Yeah, college costs a lot of money. But if you don't go, then your lifetime earnings are more likely to be lower. In addition, some people need assistance going to college, either Pell Grants or student loans or other kinds of scholarships. And that's what we're doing or need to do investing in our clean tech sector. China is investing $12 billion a month in its clean tech sector. The House Republican budget that just passed would cut our overall investments in a couple of years to about a billion dollars a year or what, you know, one 144th of what China spends in a year. Um, that may be penny wise, but it is tens of thousands of dollars pound foolish. You know, it's, it's fascinating because China's come up several times in this conversation, and I'm sure it'll come up again before the hour is over. China is both the dirtiest and the greenest country in the world. They're doing all kinds of fascinating modern things that will, yeah, undoubtedly save them tons of money down the road. But they're also a 19th century industrial plant at the same time. Yeah, but uh, what, what uh, you guys were saying of the, uh, the, uh, um, the previous uh, piece that you, we just uh, witnessed right now, um, what we save in here is peanuts. I mean, it's $40 million in green jobs. It's ridiculous. I mean, that is nothing. It's a drop of water in the ocean. When we have uh, oil companies getting, in the past 10 years, oil companies got almost $73 billion dollars in tax breaks and subsidies from the federal government. $73 billion, that's real money, okay? Not only that, it, during, during, um, between 2001 and 2010, big oil made almost a trillion dollars in profits, and we're still pumping money into these corporations. That's what the real money is. It's not in the pesticide or the, uh, the green jobs and all these little things that we're doing here that, uh, uh, to the ears of a foreigner, all this sounds really, really sometimes ridiculous, okay? Because the real money is there, but this, what we lack is the, po the political uh, will to go after the big money. But that's assuming that the big money would go to these, these worthwhile, worthy programs if we started collecting it in taxes from the oil companies. Would it? I mean, is it, is it one thing or the other? Or if we stop those subsidies to oil companies, would we really plow it into green jobs, Andrea? We should. We're giving $4 billion annually to oil. And look what, if you look at the pumps right now, oil prices are exceeding uh, uh, $3. They maybe reach 5 to $6, some experts are saying, by the summer. You know, we're just, you know, one environmental disaster away in the right place that may make our family budgets be increasingly affected by increasing oil prices. And what is, what is that question about? It's about sustainability. How do we meet our social, our economic, and our security needs while also making sure that we're not undermining environmental quality and we're not continuing to deplete scarce resources that are polluting our communities? Now, I'm glad that we had both Philadelphia and Greensburg, Kansas in that report because they were coming at this from two very different places. Greensburg had a rebuild. It was smashed. So you could start from the beginning, from scratch, with new, smart, energy efficient technology. Philadelphia has lost a million people, has empty factories all over the city, has an ancient industrial infrastructure, and it's kind of tough for a place like Philadelphia to repair itself 
for the 21st century, while Greensburg got to start from scratch. How do places like Philadelphia, which is a lot of um, urban America right now, get 21st century modern? How do we do it? Daniel? Well, we need to invest in our infrastructure, uh, it, like things like transportation. Let's invest in you know buses and uh, subways, so that way people can get around without having to pump gas. That'll save them money. That'll create jobs. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there are places in the other end of the state, uh, closed uh, steel factories that are now reopened, making uh, high-tech superficial windows. So those kinds of investments can lead to a rebirth of our manufacturing sector, but only if we make the investments. It, like I said, it's like going to college. Yes, you can uh, have a certain kind of job with a high school diploma, but if you invest some money in learning more and studying, then you can get a better paying job uh, with a college education. This isn't, there's a difference between spending and investment. Giving $4 billion a year to big oil companies that made a, a trillion dollars in profits nearly over the last 10 years, that's spending. Spending money to invest in advanced battery factories like we've done in the last couple years that have created over 60,000 jobs to make the advanced batteries that the world's going to want to power electric vehicles, those are investments. And we need to do that in places like Philadelphia, like in Michigan, like other places around the country where the economies are suffering. Can we do that without subsidies, though? Can jobs in retrofitting, in putting green roofs on, on America's houses, uh, in making those new batteries, can those exist without subsidies? Is there enough in it for an industrialist to say, yes, this is a business I should be in, without a government subsidy, because that's a job that'll last for the future, while a job that only exists because of a subsidy may go away, may stick around, may not. Andrea, what, what role do subsidies play in all of this? They provide uh, businesses with the incentive to invest their capital. With the, as I mentioned, with the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, businesses met a lot of the federal funding with their own capital because they're willing to take that step towards environmentally friendly practices, sustainable behaviors, anything that's going to reduce their energy consumption and essentially uh, their bottom line in the future. But they need to know that they have federal support to continue to invest. A lot of states have done this. In New Jersey, for example, uh, renewable energy uh, portfolios requiring certain power plants to consume a certain percentage of their energy from renewable energy sources. It's what's already driving people to look for cleaner technologies and employ people to come in and audit their company to see how they can reduce energy costs, how they can reduce consumption and pollution long term. You know, Andrea's right is that a lot of these programs provide seed money and then attracts far more private investment than the amount that the federal government put in. Some of these programs under the Recovery Act have uh, generate up to nine dollars in private investment for every one dollar in uh, federal uh, revenue investment. So it's a, it's a way of sort of jump-starting the process. You know, it's interesting. There's a talk about subsidies and cutting subsidies for solar and wind. We've been subsidizing the oil and gas industry for 90 years. We've been subsidizing the nuclear industry for, for 60 years. Um, now, as there's a big hue and cry about you know, trying to get the wind and solar industries off the ground, uh, we're forgetting that the playing field is already tilted in one direction. As Javier was saying, we spend about six dollars in subsidies for fossil fuels for every one dollar investment in wind, solar, and other renewable energies. There's two very good examples of what he's saying right now. Um, uh, Michigan, you were talking about Philadelphia being all, all infrastructure, all industrial infrastructure and all that. Michigan is right now leading the country in, in, in job creation, Michigan. And it's because of the clean energy, clean economy that they, they have there. California, uh, if you remember last year, we were fighting Proposition 23 that it was uh, driven by the oil companies that they didn't want uh, all these investments going into green, the green economy. Fortunately, we were able to defeat it. The fact is, the only sector of the economy in California that is actually growing and creating jobs right now is the green economy. So this is, we have really good examples of how this thing is actually working. What you were saying, or what you were saying about subsidies, the oil and the coal uh, industries don't want to see that money go, go away to someone else. They want it for themselves. So they give you all these uh, fictions about the fact that uh, if we don't give the money to them, uh, there will be no job creation. 
and so forth. It's, it's just a competition between the oil economy and the new one. Let's take a break. And don't forget, you can keep the conversation going by posting comments on the blog at www.hitn.tv slash DCB. Destination Casablanca will continue in a moment.